Okay, now we're over here with Coach Smith now, and what we're going to do is go through a couple demonstrations now of certain rules that's been implemented and what you can look for. So one of the rules, Coach, is what we talked about is the arm bar. Mm. That's something now that we want to um, let the freedom of movement of basketball. So what would you say, what is what you're trying to explain? What are you looking for as an official when a defender has his arm bar on him and you got the, basket, got the offensive player and he's here? What are you looking at at that time? I'm telling him to drop the arm. I tell the player if I get a chance to say I've never seen anybody score with their back to the basket in a game. So if you're trying to steer that player with mm -hmm. your arm, that's a foul every time down the court. Okay, so what would you suggest that they do? What would be a good legal guardian position for them? If you're going to overplay and deny, I would definitely ask you to do that because the, the referee is looking right here if you do any pressure or displace that player or make contact with his body while he is dribbling. That'll be a foul every night. Okay, so if he has his arm bar on him, put your arm back, your arm bar, so then if he starts to make that move. You're dropping the arm as soon as he has the ball. And I'm even, I go as far as just take that arm off. If you get the player that's comfortable, he's gonna lean on, that's just, I, I know the coaches don't teach lazy defense. I don't wanna push him out of position and just leave my arm up there. I'm saying get the arm off. And you tell that in the first quarter because you don't want anybody coming in and doing it in the fourth, and then you're letting it go. Things just get real tough inside in the paint. Oh, yeah, absolutely. especially in the painting area when things can get very physical. Mm. Now, with new rules and with the intentional foul, it's really not a new rule. It's a rule yeah. that we want to enforce, where at the end of the game you have players and, you know, sometimes you got coaches trying to foul to put a one-on-one -on -one situation, preserve the clock or what have you, and you have players. Now, the rules state you have to go for the ball. Yes. So now we want to point point of emphasis is going for the ball. So if I'm the drib I'm the dribbler and I have the ball and you're the defender, what are you looking for the defender to do and some of the things you don't want him to do? Uh, what I like to see him do is make a play on the ball and he's making contact and it's obvious that it's a foul and they're looking to foul, but at the same time he's not overly aggressive. I don't want to see him coming up near the head area or taking two hands and give him just a shove or a push any part of his body because two hands almost always will be an intentional foul if you do it excessively. So you want to make a play. If he has the ball, try to make a play on the ball. That way contact is made and the official can say, okay, I have no problem. The fist goes up, I have a foul. When we call an intentional foul, that's because you're going to take two hands and in many cases just grab the jersey or pull on the shoulders or take two hands and shove the offensive player. That is an intentional foul. Because like sometimes what we see is we see a defender and he's dribbling. He went for the defender. He didn't get a hold of him and he just rolls out and says, well, I'll just grab him because he got by me. That is an intentional foul. That is an intentional foul. And again, we want to make sure we get that as early as possible so the coaches can instruct. And nine out of ten coaches will say, I did not teach you to do that. But a player out of frustration or just tired just grabs and because the coach is yelling foul. And it's just that one moment they forgot. And as an official, we should be calling an intentional foul. Now, also, what we have, and we have a beautiful tool, contrary to popular belief, people think that um, officials like to call technical fouls, which we no. don't. We don't like to be a part of, game, part of the game, as you alluded to earlier. So we implemented a new tool this year that kind of gives the officials and works with the coaches a little bit where you're giving a warning to the head coach prior to sometimes giving a technical foul. Doesn't mean that they couldn't earn a technical foul Correct. on one of the first offenses, but we have a little bit of wiggle room. I don't want wiggle room is the right word, but a little bit tool to work with to kind of manage the game a little bit better. Talk about a little bit about the new rule where we're giving head coaches warnings. Yes, we get, what, a lot of times since we only have two officials, we don't have that luxury to let's say look at the bench. It might have been an assistant or even a player that yelled it didn't like a call that we did or didn't make. And instead of me turning around and addressing it, and a player may be on the court, I can just blow my whistle and say, warning to team A bench. And that covers everybody for the whole game. Now, as you just said, I don't have to give that warning. If I think it's severe enough or my partner does, we want to tee up the bench or the coach, then we may. But a warning is just a nice way of saying you're going too far. Just step back. Let's regroup here. Don't push it. And, and then so far, 
the feedback I'm getting, it's really worked out well. And none of the coaches have said, at least that I'm aware of, wait, you didn't give me a warning. Because the coach right. knows when he goes over that line and you tee him up, and it's deservingly so. But that warning is a nice little uh, barrier for us to say, okay, coach, I'm drawing the line in the sand. What would you say to an, if, would you say to an, if some of the uh, officials who would say, we're kind of inviting the coach to say, well, you didn't give me a warning yet, and that they use that as latitude to kind of get at the official. What did, would you say to that? I would just say you're in control of your game, and everybody has that line. Something that I may see may tee up a coach, another official may want to come back down and say, coach, that's enough, or give that warning. But again, if the coach is going after you or your partner, then it doesn't warn an, a warning. You just tee him up and we move on. Absolutely. There's no grudges being held here. We're just letting game. We're moving on with the game. I like the new rule, actually. I really do. Mm -hmm. I really like the new rule. Yeah. Um, Seems to be beneficial. Yes. Um, now, finally, um, now, how's the, how, how would you characterize? We finally, um, it, it filtered down to the high school level where the mechanics that we use now for reporting fouls are with two hands as opposed to one. How is that happening? Even for yourself, how have you got accustomed to that? Uh, the scorekeepers and timekeepers are part of our team. So we also want to verbalize, when we're reporting, for those who didn't know, uh, we would, let's say it was blue 22, we blue 2, 2, and then we'd signal the infraction. In this case, it was a push. Now we're using two hands. So obviously it takes a little thinking because if, when I'm reporting to the table, it's 32, I'm going to go 23, so that person knows what number I have because they're reading left to right. right. And the reason we're encouraging our officials to verbalize is if the heat of the game or it gets too loud, at least you can say things and it'll be carried over. Wait a minute, you, said, you showed me 23, but you said 32. And then they know verbalizing it will make it a little bit easier. But the scorekeeper is the one that wins out in this because now they can see the both numbers. And let's face it, some officials may get a little too quick and do a quick number. And now this way with two, it slows things down. And hopefully everybody uh, gets advantage of it. Now, I've been out to a couple games, of course, and I've seen some of the frustration on the fans because the game has been stopped periodically at times with the uniform issue. Yeah. What would you just encourage them, uh, the uniforms? And I know that's a real sticky situation. The game gets going, but proper etiquette as far as uniform-wise, talk a little bit about what's the legal, legal aspect of uniform and wearing them. It's tough because you watch TV, as I did the other night, and just – Every single person on a college team has their uniform, the waist rolled down, and the tags hanging out. And to me, that just looks shoddy. It just it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get it. I don't know why it's not addressed at that level. But at the high school level, uh, we spend a lot of time before we toss that ball up, make sure that the court is clear, the cheerleaders are not in the way, that the time is set, and then we, we, we look at all the players, make sure the uniforms are done correctly. Some of us call call us the uniform police. <laughs> and I know in girls basketball, they're allowed to roll it down again. Uh, boys, in some programs, the shorts are just too big and they can't keep them up. But we've given them enough warning now that they can address it, whether with an extra string tape or what have you, but we're not gonna let them play with the waistband reversed. Well, that's it, that's Officials Corner. Thanks a lot, we appreciate your time. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Cool.